There's no place to hide as I step inside the classroom. Dr. Doom, prepare for the boom. Bam, all oh man, I slam jam. Now I scream like Tarzan, woo. I'm rigging, disrupting, my style is awesome. I'm causing more family feuds than Richard Dawson. All right. We're going to talk about mechanical advantages. We're going to go over counting tensions and estimating system efficiency. So this is be part one, which will just be going over counting tensions within your system. So I'm going to work off a couple of screens here. Um, so this is going to be a quick talk about just counting tensions and mechanical advantage system. For some, this technique is used when first learning mechanical advantage systems to figure out what they're even building. And second, kind of checking other people's systems so they got a, a – view on what's going on. There's a lot of confusion sometimes on moving pulleys versus stationary pulleys and what adds to the mechanical advantage. This is just an easy way to go through that. Others use it for determining the mechanical advantage, more complicated systems like Spanish Burtons, which we have in here also in certain complex uh, systems that are used in mountaineering and rigging and climbing. The other side of it is a lot of people will use this just to estimate what the forces are on the anchor. You're going to see that depending on how we have it rigged, whether we're pulling against the anchor or pulling with the anchor, we'll change the force that is placed on that anchor when we're actually pulling. And in some cases, when we're pulling, it'll actually be more force on our anchor than what it is on our load. So that's typically the, the framework in which counting tensions comes in handy. We'll go into a little bit more um, examples of the relevance of it and where it's irrelevant. This is very Newtonian in nature, meaning that it's linear physics and nothing in the real world where you work is linear. It's all nonlinear. So there's a lot of other things that are going to play a role in what your true actual mechanical advantage is. But this is actually where, where we have to start. So getting into this, we will start right here. So this is just going to be a quick review of linear physics and what MAs do. Um, in Newtonian uh, physics, it's linear by nature. It's very straightforward. It's additive, not multiplicative. And you can actually reduce it, meaning that you can use reductionism to reduce every single little part of it, add it together, and get the accurate hold of what it is, also called superposition. So with that, that is indicative of something that's linear, which we can do here. Once we start going into the nonlinear realm where we're looking at different frictions, not only within the pulleys or within your system, but friction over edges, bending rigidity of your ropes, um, the nonlinear phenomena that occurs in manufacturing of your ropes anyways, then a lot of those principles go out the window and we can't use those as, as often. So real quick on here, if the rope knot, and we're talking about continuous mechanical advantages here. So if the knot of your rope starts at the load, which is the case right here on the far left on the one-to-one, -one, also the case on your three-to-one and five-to-one over here, then your mechanical advantage is going to be odd. If the knot starts at your anchor, which is the case right here on your two-to-one, then you know that your mechanical advantage is going to be even. Like we said before, that's in building these systems up. Once you start getting into systems that are piggybacked and, and other systems, you, you've got to watch it a little bit closer. So starting off with that, just very, very basic. If I would start pulling on this rope just from here without having even this pulley, as I pull up, for every foot that I pull up, that load will raise. When I go through a change of direction, which is just a fixed pulley, so this pulley is not moving at all, it's attached to my anchor, and in this case I'm pulling down, that is going to be a one-to-one. -one. Um, and we'll kind of get over counting tensions here in a second, but it will require one foot of pull for me to lift up one foot from the load. When we get into, let's say, this two-to-one, how the energy is dispersed here, as I'm pulling here from this haul line, uh, the other end of my rope is attached to an anchor. That rope then goes down to my load. There's a pulley, and now I'm pulling up on that. In that case, I've got to pull two feet to be able to move the load one foot. So in the end, if you think about levers, that longer the lever it is, uh, the easier it is to lift up. But every little part, I've got to pull down a lot more to get any kind of lift from that other end, and it's very similar uh, in that we can actually look at it if you want to get nerded out on it we can actually look at fixed pulleys are very similar in nature to if, if we go across the board into let's say some of your lifting techniques in technical rescue that would be equivalent to your class one lever where a moving pulley in this case would be equivalent to your class two lever and if you think about it from a lever standpoint 
if you think about when, when you're building a class one weaver, right, I'm going to put my effort here. So if my load is sitting here, I'm going to put effort down here. So that effort goes in. So I have my effort. I've got a fulcrum and then I've got my load that I'm lifting. And so if you think about it that way, I've got my effort here from the haul line. I've got my fulcrum right here on my pulley, which is a fixed anchor uh, pulley. And then here I have my load. So it's actually the exact same mechanics as when we're talking about class one levers. If I'm looking at my class two lever, which is typically used to roll something over. In that case, I have my effort here, which has to be pushed up. Uh, on that, I then have my load, which is kind of in the middle. And then this lever that I have is usually going underneath that. And then it's articulating with the ground and that's my fulcrum. So I actually have the effort load and then fulcrum as I'm doing a class two lever. That's really what we have here too. So we have our effort load or our effort right here. Then here we have our load and then I have the fulcrum there. So it matches the same sequential process that your levers do also. That was kind of a side note. If we get into a three to one and we'll talk about why this is a three to one and this is a five to one complex, but on a three to one, I then have to lift three feet, pull three feet of rope to be able to move that load one foot. So although I have one third of the weight in my hands as I'm pulling, the anchor has the other two thirds of the weight, uh, making it easier for me to pull. Then getting into a complex system here, uh, this is your five to one in which I have now got to pull five feet of rope to be able to move my load one foot. So in that, just like a lever, much easier to lift, although I've got to do a lot more movement with it um, is what makes it easier. So we'll get into counting tensions of why this is even a five to one, that's a three to one, two to one, obviously in a one to one, but just understand that this is linear. And when we're talking about it, we are not talking about friction or anything else in there. And we'll kind of give you some of the background into that. So this assumes that uh, whoever's listening to this has a basic understanding of mechanical advantage rope systems. What is presented in this video cast is straight up linear physics, so it's Newtonian in nature, not representative of the real world application, but this is where we need to start. So when we get into building in efficiencies, we're gonna start it off the same way, except we're gonna start adding in things like friction to be able to understand what our true mechanical advantage actually is. We'll be counting tensions uh, within a mechanical advantage system to determine the theoretical mechanical advantage. I've got some asterisks going in here. There's a bunch of different definitions. So if you go ahead and, and look in uh, any kind of Google or, or Bing searches, you're gonna see a bunch of varied definitions for what ideal mechanical advantage, theoretical mechanical advantage, and actual mechanical advantage is. Actually, the actual mechanical advantage is pretty straightforward. That is, in the end, you how much you're pulling, how much force you have to pull with everything accounted for from edge, uh, you know, as far as what kind of edge you're dealing with, what the coefficient of friction is on that, what the friction is within your pulleys, all those things is what makes up your actual mechanical advantage when all is said and done. Where the confusion comes in is when you're talking about ideal MAs and theoretical MAs. So for our purposes on this one, we're going to go with more of a classical understanding of theoretical MAs from the physics world which says basically a theoretical MA is that, that theoretical type of thing in science where this is what it is before we add anything else into it. So a theoretical MA for our purposes assumes a frictionless world. So there is no friction in your pulleys. There's no frictions over the edge. Uh, it's kind of that make-believe world, that theoretical world. Uh, the ideal MA, a lot of times uh, when you read and look into some of the encyclopedias and some of the physics books compared to some of the rope rescue books, and you are gonna see different, people use it in different ways, so be cautious of that. Ideal for us is if I've got a bag of whatever, I can make, if, I, if I've got uh, pulleys with, with bushings in them that, that aren't as efficient, and I've got a couple that are very efficient pulleys, like Rock Exotica with closed seal bearing pulleys in them, uh, my ideal is what would be ideal for me to be able to make or construct and what order do I put the pulleys to create the most efficient pulley system in there. Some of your definitions out there will say ideal and theoretical are the same thing, blah, blah, blah. For us, just putting that into the background, theoretical for us is there is no friction in your system. It's kind of make-believe and then we'll get into dealing with efficiencies and understanding how that coordinates into our system and what kind of impact that has. All right, concepts to remember. There are sometimes 
easy ways to find the MA of a simple or compound Hall system. Uh, we can look at just counting the line supporting, and we'll talk about that when we look at some examples. Uh, supporting the load as a simple system, or we can actually see where one MA is pulling on another MA, know that that's a compound, see what the MA is pulling on the other MA, and then we can actually multiply those together to get what, a, what that is. So we don't always have to use the techniques that we're teaching you here as far as counting tensions, although they work on everything. There's shortcuts around that that you may want to use. When we do need to be able to count tensions is typically when we start dealing with complex systems or your complex systems also include Spanish Burton systems or variants that you'll see in there, usually within mountaineering or sometimes within rescue. So that is really the only way we can tell what the mechanical advantage is. There's three ways of kind of finding out what your MA is. If you're just building some random crap around the firehouse or on the floor of your team room, and out of all three, counting tensions is probably the most applicable way that you can do in the field very quickly and be able to give a thumbs up or thumbs down to what you believe that system is and how much forces on your anchor. So, you know, just as a comparison, we're going to be counting tensions within our system, being able to, to follow that through the entire line, starting where our hull system is, or our hull line is. The other ways you could do it is I could take that load and I could weigh it and get an exact representation of what that load weighs and then build my mechanical advantage system or whatever I think it is and then put that same measuring device to show how many newtons of force I'm, I'm pulling and knowing what the end weight is and then pulling on that one, then I can divide that out and say that's what I have. Most of us don't roll around with very um, elaborate systems to detect what the measurement devices are on that. Not, not probably the way to go. The other one to do is I can put that load up and from where my load is, I can draw exactly where one foot is and mark that. And then as soon as I do the same thing on my haul line is start right where I start with my haul line, pull my haul line. And when my load reaches that foot, then I count how much rope I pull, pulled. And then that will give you the mechanical advantage. Also not really applicable. So counting tensions is kind of the, the way in which we're going we're gonna to hit on this. So we always start counting tensions from the haul line where the rescuer's hands grab to pull the rope and work our way back through the system all the way to our load. Uh, we'll always start with one tension when we input on the haul line. The reason that we do that is regardless of how much you can pull, we just count that as one tension. So if you get up on that rope and you pull 100 pounds, still one tension because it's going to be that force that you're putting into it is the one on the mechanical advantage ratio. So that is your input. So if I'm inputting 20 pounds of force or I'm inputting 200 pounds of force, it's still gonna be whatever force I input is one unit. So that is the one, the first number in your mechanical advantage, the three, the five, the six, that is what's gonna be outputted. So that is the magnification of your one input. So if I input 100 pounds, I get 300 pounds out. If I input 100 pounds, I get 500 pounds out. So that is how that ratio goes. So we are gonna always start with one tension because it's irregardless of how much force we're actually putting into that that gets magnified. All prussics in our system, so when we talk prussics, we're talking rope grabs, um, are always going to be an addition sign. So it's the T-block, it's the rope man too. It's that, that is always going to be an addition sign, uh, except for if you happen to be using a camming uh, device as a progressive capture, then that all that does is hold your load when you let go of the rope. So whether that's a prussic or that's an internal camming device, or a Grigory or whatever the hell you're using, um, that is not going to be a point of addition. So it's just going to be those things that are used as rope grabs. And we stop at all rope grabs to see if we need to perform addition. Lastly, before we get started, is pulleys are a force multiplier. So pulleys, regardless of whether they're moving or they're fixed on an anchor or they're moving up in your mechanical advantage, don't know that they're moving or they're fixed. They just multiply force. So if we go back to simple machines and we look at a pulley, Pulleys are used to magnify force, so they'll magnify that force, whether it's at an anchor or whether it's as a rope grab that's moving. In the end, obviously, only moving pulleys are articulating with your mechanical advantage or adding to your mechanical advantage, where a fixed pulley is just that. It's just a, a change of direction. So people get that kind of confused that only moving pulleys add to uh, a, multipl uh, a multiplication of their force. 
and that's not true. Uh, we're going to see that on anchors, and that's something you got to be kind of cognizant about. So if we look at the regular pulley, this kind of gives you the cheat for counting tensions uh, in there. So what we see on this Rock Exotica uh, micro pulley is how strong this pulley is. It's 30 kilonewtons strong, and that shows you that if you have 15 kilonewtons on one side, you have to have 15 kilonewtons on the other. And that can be expressed in tensions, right? And that's what we're expressing it in. So if you think about it, if one tension comes into this pulley, one tension has to come out, which means that pulley is now supporting two tensions. So if you think about it, equal and opposite reaction. So if I'm pulling down on this side, this side's raising up, and I'm pulling down with 100 pounds of force, and this is, you know, 100 pounds. So this is raising up. I have 100 pounds of force here. I have 100 pounds of force here both being put onto that pulley. So 200 pounds is what's being seen at the apex of that pulley. So whatever's going in on one side is, is equal on the other side when we're counting tensions like this. So one comes in, one has to come out. So just remember, look at any pulley that you have and that's usually how their weight is depicted on there. Uh, the MA is the final number that's sitting at the load when we're counting tensions and don't ignore the anchor number. A lot of people just kind of roll right past the anchor no number, not realizing that when we're pulling against that anchor, we're having a magnified force. If we're pulling with the anchor, that's what I'm gonna be wanting to use if I've got an anchor that's maybe somewhat questionable, or I definitely don't wanna overload that, and we'll kind of see what that force looks like. All right, so counting tensions. A lot of folks will use counting tensions just for complex, MAs. We teach it starting from the get-go. So as soon as we even start talking about a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one, we're already adding um, how to count tensions into it just because most people are very familiar with a one-to-one, -one, a two-to-one, a three-to-one. And so when we're looking at that, we want to start them understanding the concept of counting tensions on systems that they're already familiar with. Uh, it just makes it easier. So when we get into those complex systems, they, they have more of a, a, a foundational toolbox to, to understand what exactly is going on. So just like we said before, we're gonna start at the end of the haul line with an initial input of one. The MA is the number that terminates at the load and the anchor number is also important. So we have that depicted in all of our examples also. So on this one-to-one, -one, my force is gonna be pulling down. This is where I grab boom, to, to pull that load up, right? So we already know from our previous uh, example, that I pull one foot, load raises one foot on that one-to-one. -one. So as I pull down, I have a one. That one that I'm pulling on is transferred up to this pulley. So as I'm pulling down, my one unit of tension, regardless if it's 100 pounds, 50 pounds, 200 pounds, is going up this thing. So if I have one that comes in, one has to come out. Equal and opposite, just like what we saw in that previous slide, right up here. So if one comes in, one has to come out. So when we're looking at it in this form, one comes in, one comes out, which means I have two tensions up here. That one continues, so one comes in, one comes out, one goes all the way down to my load, and I'm left with one. We know our mechanical advantage is whatever that number is after we finish going through our whole system that terminates at the load. So all we have here is a one-to-one -one mechanical advantage. When we look at this example, right, I start pulling on my haul line, so I'm gonna be pulling up to lift this load up. So as that one tension goes down, one tension goes down. If one goes in, one comes out of that pulley and two is left at the apex. Obviously it's upside down. So two is left there. That one comes all the way back up and terminates at my anchor. So I only have one load, uh, one tension at my anchor, but I have two at my load, which means I have a two to one mechanical advantage. If we go back to the first example here, and let's just put numbers to it so we can see the reason that this anchor number is two, which is bigger than what my MA number is here, which is my load, which is one, um, is because I'm pulling against my anchor. So your pulleys multiply force. So when I look at that, I pull down with one tension. One tension is on the other side because it's being raised up at the same amount of force that I'm putting into it for linear stuff. And that means two is over here. So let's just put a, let's say that this is 100 pounds down here, 100 pound load. So I'm inputting 100 pounds to raise that. Actually, because of friction, it would be a little bit more, but whatever. So I'm inputting one. 
So I've got 100 pounds coming in. I have 100 pounds over here, which means I have 200 pounds being supported by my pulley. So when I'm pulling against that anchor, although I'm only lifting 100 pounds, as I'm pulling and magnification is occurring, then I do have 200 pounds of force being placed on my anchor at that point. All right, moving over here, this is where people kind of get mixed up a little bit, is just by adding a change of direction. So if you think about lifting up a casualty in an elevator shaft. So I could be doing a two to one where my anchor is up by me because that's where the rope not starting. And if it starts at my anchor, the rope and go it leaves from there, I know that's going to be even. So I know I'm, I've got an even MA on this one and it goes down to my casualty. There's a pulley on my casualty and I am lifting up. It's going to be difficult to sit there and just sit there and squat going up. Uh, so I may want to put a change of direction in. So that's what we did here. So this is just a two to one with a change of direction. This pulley is actually on my anchor. So it's an, a fixed pulley staying right here at my anchor. So as I pull down on this, this is all part of my anchor. So in it, it doesn't add or change my mechanical advantage when I'm counting tensions. Uh, it will change my efficiency, but that's, that's another PowerPoint. So as I'm pulling down on this, if one comes in, one comes out, and I've got two on this anchor point. That one continues down, one goes in, one comes out, I've got two on my load, one comes up and terminates. So when I add these together, I've got two tensions over here, one tension over here, so my anchor is seeing three tensions, and my load is two, which is a two to one with a change of direction. So change of directions, do not alter your mechanical advantage. It just adds in a change of direction. So my fixed pulleys do not add to my mechanical advantage, only my moving pulleys do. And we'll kind of see, when you see how to count efficiencies, you'll see how that impacts your, your system dynamics and behavior a little bit more. So let's move on to other systems here. Now we get into using things that have a rope grab. So these are depicted just as prussics. These can be uh, T-block, they can be a rope man, whatever you need. These up here, uh, it's just your progressive capture. So this is your, your anchor point with your progressive capture. In this case, um, we illustrated that with, with just a prusik on there for, for simplicity's sake. So on this system, we're looking at it and we say, okay, you know what, the rope is starting from my load and going up, so I know it's gonna be odd. Um, as we look at this, I can look at my haul line. So as I'm pulling up, I've been putting one tension. One tension goes into this pulley. One tension has to come out of that pulley. And that means that I have two tensions sitting right here on my prusik line at the apex of that pulley because I have one over here, one over there. I've got to have two over here. So as one comes in, one comes out, I have two sitting on that prusik. And as my one goes up into my progressive capture, one has to come out. So I have two sitting on my anchor point. As that one comes out, it goes down all the way to the prusik, and every time I see a prusik, like what we said, you should picture an addition sign. So you can kind of see what we've done in there and just add kind of a plus sign. So because that, that prusik or that rope grab will always be holding a certain amount of tension uh, from this pulley here. So in this case, it's holding two tensions. So as one comes down, one meets with my prusik, so one plus two is three. So from this point down, I have three tensions. So that is a three to one Z drag. So that's very, very common mechanical advantage that we use. And that is the case. So over here, to, to kind of work us through what happens when we do a change of direction and what that means as far as force goes, uh, all we did was do a three to one Z drag, but we added a change of direction. So it, it, for one way or another, if we're doing an elevator shaft, it just makes it easier for us to pull down than to continually pull up. So we added a change of direction in there. And what we want to show you on this is that it didn't change the mechanical advantage. It's just the mechanical advantage with a change of direction. So I input one tension, one tension comes in, one tension comes out, I have two at the apex. As that one tension moves down to another pulley, one tension moves, it comes in, one tension has to come out. So now I have two sitting on that prusik, which will be a plus sign. As that one tension moves up to my progressive capture, one goes in, one comes out, two is at my anchor. That one continues down, meets up with the prusik, the prusik's holding two, one plus two is three, I've got a three to one Z drag with a change of direction. Meanwhile, I have four tensions on my anchor. So why is that important? Uh, just for simplicity, I'm a product of Southern education, so we'll keep it super easy. Let's say I'm lifting a load that's approximately 300 pounds. So just knowing that we can input, my haulers can input about 100 pounds of force, uh, we feel comfortable going with a three to one, right? We always wanna go with the, the least amount of MA that we can 
reasonably handle just because it's more efficient, meaning that I don't have to pull as much rope. Although I could go to a five to one to make it easier. Do we need it? If we don't need it, let's not do it. So that way we're not finding ourselves pulling five feet of rope to move it only one foot. In this case, we're moving three feet of rope to move it one foot. But I've got four on my anchor. Why? Because I'm pulling against my anchor. That is what's adding the magnification of force. So with that, if I'm raising something that's 300 pounds, let's work that through. So if I'm raising something 300 pounds and I input 100 pounds of force because it's on a three to one, I know I'll have to input approximately 100 pounds of force. 100 goes in, 100 goes out, 200 pounds of force is sitting on this anchor. 100 pounds comes down, 100 pounds goes in, 100 pounds goes out, 200 pounds of force is sitting on that prusik. 100 pounds of force goes up through my progressive capture, 100 pounds of force comes out. 200 pounds are sitting up here, 100 pounds goes and meets my prusik, plus 200, so I've got 300 pounds of force, which is equivalent to what my three to one is. So that all adds up nicely. But as I'm pulling, meaning only when I'm pulling do pulleys magnify their force, uh, I will have approximately 400 pounds of force on my anchor in this scenario. When I let go and my progressive capture holds it, then it's only going to be this line that's holding my 300 pounds of force. Only when I'm pulling, actually, and rope is moving through your pulleys, your carabiners, whatever devices you're using, that's the only time where you have the magnification of force. All right, so moving over here, we're going to get into some kooky ones. So as we said before, if I looked at these and I wanted to do just a very simplistic way of, of counting tensions, a lot of people say, hey, just count the amount of lines that are supporting your load which is fine for simple mechanical advantages. And you can actually, if you can break your mechanical advantages up, you can do that for compounds also. So if I looked at this and I just drew a box right around this area here, I said, all right, how many ropes are, when I'm pulling, how many ropes are supporting my load? I can make one, two, three, it's three to one, right? And that's completely accurate. The problem is, is once we get into complex systems and most of the Spanish Burtons, we no longer can just count how many ropes are supporting, right? If I would do the same thing over here, I would draw a box around and still know these aren't doing anything supporting it, right? These aren't supporting in an upward manner of my load. I still just have one, two, three. That's just a change of direction. So that's not supporting my rope at all. That's, that's a pull down line. That goes out the door when we start dealing with complexes. So here is a basic Spanish Burton three to one. So when you look at this, this is done a lot of times in mountaineering because you can turn around and use this for um, modified systems where I have just enough rope to reach my load and maybe I have some cordelette, uh, some six mo cordelette, or I can even do it with maybe a dyneema sling or anything like that to start creating that mechanical advantage. So this is a little bit more of an improv way of doing it. So this is a separate rope right here, just this small little bit right here. And my main line is the main piece going from my load around through my progressive capture. So to figure this out, I start where my, line, my hands go to pull. So I'm always gonna be with one. So if one goes in, one comes out, and two is sitting on that prusik, which is actually gonna be pulling my main line. So one goes in, one comes out, two is sitting there. One comes down and terminates on my prusik. So this prusik is only seeing one tension. So this is nothing more than a sling put in the carabiner, then wrapped up through a pulley and I'm pulling down, or it could be a knotted cordelette. So it'd be like a figure eight, a double bite bowl and whatever on that carabiner right here. And then that small piece of cordelette that I'm using is going up through that pulley and back down. So right there, one goes in, one comes out, one terminates here. So I only have one on my prusik down here, but I do have two up here, right? Because it's at the apex of my pulley. So now as I'm pulling down, what is that doing up here to my main line? It's pulling down with two tensions. So if two goes in, two comes out, and I have four on this anchor. As this moves down, my two, right? Two goes in, two goes out. Two comes down, meets with my one. We add those together to get three. So three to one, Spanish Bolton. All right, moving in. Getting to a little bit more common on the first two here. So this is nothing more than a five to one simple mechanical advantage. What we did is usually that's seen with a double pulley here. Uh, we use the ARS in a, in a different version of a roll clip uh, to make it kind of easy for us instead of dedicating ourselves to a double pulley. But a lot of times you'll see Simple five to ones done with a double pulley. So what we did for the purpose of counting these is we just separated the double pulley into two singles so you can kind of see what's going on on the front and back end of your double pulley. So right off the bat, these are my anchor points right here. 
This is my moving pulley, which would be a double pulley. We just separate those out. One comes in, one comes out, two is sitting on the back side of that uh, sheave. One goes in, one comes out, two is at the apex on this anchor. One continues down into the second part of my double pulley, into the front there, and I have one come in, one come out, so I have another two. So that one double pulley has four tensions uh, uh, force put into them. So four sitting on that pressing. Continuing up, one goes into my progressive capture, one comes out, I have additional two on this anchor point. That one comes down, meets with the four that was come up from the double pulley, right? So if you think about it, one, two, three, four, four tensions right there. Four plus one is five, and I've got a five to one simple mechanical advantage, right? So my simple mechanical advantage, I understand it's simple because I've got one continuous rope moving through my system. All my pulleys are moving in one direction, but more importantly, which separates it from a compound, is all my pulleys are moving at the same speed. That's how I know I don't have a mechanical advantage on top of a mechanical advantage because both of those would be pulling at two different speeds. So your pulleys would be moving at two different rates in your system. So that is a simple mechanical advantage. When we get over here to the other side, now we basically have to what looks to be like what the three to one with the change of direction was, except we don't have the anchor point. We actually put it on with a prusik onto the back side of my progressive capture. So this is my load side. This is my haul side, so press it gets put onto that side of my MA. So in doing this, this is not talking about simple systems, right? My pulleys right now are not, one, not gonna be moving at the same rate because I have a MA pulling on an MA, but also they're not moving in the same direction. They're gonna be compressing against each other. They're gonna be collapsing towards each other. So when we look at it, a compound mechanical advantage, which I think we'll see in the next one, is a simple MA pulling on a simple MA where all the pulleys are moving in the same direction, although they will be moving at different rates. Um, so I can break that a three to one, pulling on the three to one is gonna be a nine to one. So when I can break up two simple systems, which we'll show in a nine to one, I can take those two and I multiply them together and that's my mechanical advantage. On a complex, we can't. So think about your Spanish Burtons over here, think about your complexes like this. So when I look at this, this is how we do it. I'm pulling on this line, so I have one come in, one come out, two is sitting here on this prusik. One comes down, one comes out. I have two sitting on this prusik because it's the apex of the pulley. Now my one coming up here, one meets with this two that's, that's been sitting on this prusik. So one plus two is three. So now in this portion here, I have three tensions. So if three goes in, three has to come out, which gives me six on my anchor. That three moves down this rope all the way until it hits this prusik, which is holding two tensions. So three plus two is five, and that's a five to one complex system. When we move over here, and I'll kind of enlarge this just a little bit uh, when we're talking about it, this is used as a, a crevasse. It's kind of a variant of a Spanish Burton. This red line that you've seen here is just like before in the three to one uh, Spanish Burton is another piece of rope, cordelette, or webbing. So on this, it's actually locked off here on the anchor. So this can be cordelette tied in a figure eight into a double bite bowline, or it could be a sling of Dyneema, a long Dyneema sling. This just put through the carabiner and then routed through my pulley down here. So when you get into this, this looks an awful lot like a three to one, except this is not attached straight to the Prusik. There's another MA system in there. So when we look at it, we're like, what the hell is it? Let's figure this out. So we'll count tensions on it. So we go in and we go, one goes in, one comes out. Two is sitting on this pole line right here, which is what our um, uh, sling or cordelette or whatever is, is attached to. Is it's fixed here and it's fixed in there. So as we pull in, one goes in, one comes out. Uh, now we need to, because this is pulling, as we pull up on this, this is being pulled on a mechanical advantage. So because we have two, two goes in, two comes out. Two terminates up here on the anchor. So because two goes in, two comes out, at the apex of that, I have four sitting on that prusik. So now when we continue this up, on the original, one goes in, one goes out. One goes in, one comes out, two's here. That one comes all the way down and meets in on that main line with the four and then I have a four to one crevasse. All right, getting into even goofier, goofier stuff here on the uh, Spanish Burton variants here is when we look at this, this is where counting tensions 
comes in place, man. Uh, to look at this and think that you're going to count how many lines are supporting and this and that and get an accurate count, you won't be. So when we look at this, this is a clove hitch. So let's just think cordelet. So I've got a knot coming onto this. It's going through here. This can be a carabiner. It can be a pulley, whatever that is. It doesn't matter when we're counting tensions. It will matter when we're counting efficiencies. So a knot here, it runs through this carabiner, comes down here and terminates into a clove hitch. Uh, or it could be two knots, doesn't matter. So if we say this is a clove hitch, then that other running into the clove hitch comes out here, and that's what we're pulling on, right? So you can see how that's all gonna kind of collapse down. So in the end, one comes in, one's gonna come out, and it terminates right here on this carabiner. So one comes in, one comes out, I have two. So two is what's pulling this line through that pulley, through that carabiner. So if two comes in, two comes out, I now have four, sitting up at the apex of this carabiner. That two continues down and terminates in the clove hitch. So I have one plus two, so three is sitting on that prusik. I have four up here, so because as I'm pulling this down, this is pulling through my progressive capture, four comes in, four comes out. I have eight up here in my anchor. That four comes down, meets with my prusik here, that's holding three tensions. Four plus three is seven, so it's a seven to one Spanish burden. Now we'll get into a little bit with, and I'll just raise this up, come over here, into a compound system. So when we're looking at this, this is nothing more. If we break this up, we got a three to one here. So if this was my haul line stopping right here, I'm pulling, that's a three to one. Then what we ended up doing is building a three to one on top of a three to one. So no problem whatsoever if you're sitting there going, okay, I'm just going to count what I got holding it. So I have a three to one being hoisted, being hauled by a three to one. Three times three is nine. You got it. Let's double check what we're looking at and to double check what we're looking at as far as anchor strength. We can start right here. One goes in, one comes out. I've got two sitting here. One comes in, one comes out. That one that follows down meets with my two, so that's three. One plus two is three, so here is three. So three goes in, three comes out, which means I have six sitting here on this prusik. As three comes in, three comes in, three comes out. I got six at my anchor. That three that came out, travels down until it hits the prusik. When I hit that prusik, three plus six is nine. That's a nine to one compound. All right, this next slide, we took some different examples that you'll see in marketing from various manufacturing companies, and we took some from physics uh, classes that you'll see on, on some textbooks, uh, encyclopedias and things like that, and figured we would just go through some of that so when you're looking at marketing material, talking to vendors or manufacturers, and you see their pictures, you can kind of get a scope on, on what they're actually talking about. And once we talk about efficiencies, then you'll be able to call BS on some of the stuff that they're actually trying to sell you, which isn't that awesome sometimes. So let's look at this one here. So when we look at this, this is taken out of Petzl's, uh, which is pretty cool. So realize that although you're seeing a carabiner here. We're gonna count it just like it's a pulley, right? As far as one going in and one going out and managing it the exact same way. So you'll see the differences between carabiners and pulleys in the efficiencies, but for our purposes, one tension goes in, one tension goes out for this portion. So here we can obviously see where the haul line is. One comes in, one comes out. I have two sitting right here on this carabiner, which is knotted to probably a long press cord here, which is tied into a rope grab up here. So one comes in, one comes out, one terminates up here uh, on that blue line, it terminates where the rope grab is. And I have two being hauled through this pulley. So if two comes in, two has to come out, four is sitting in this case on a T block. So four is sitting there, that two that came out continues up, two plus one is three. So now I have three going into this micro traction, three has to come out the micro traction, which means I would have six up here on my anchor. So that three that came uh, out, which is actually my, my load line here, that three travels down to my T block. The T block is holding four, so three plus four is seven, and that's a seven to one mechanical advantage. This one I had to kind of throw in because it was kind of interesting. So this is one of the earliest written or drawn depicted versions of a Spanish Burton, which are, wildly efficient and you'll see that in the efficiency uh, podcast or the video cast 
what's interesting about this is this was actually the basic drawing that came out of Leonardo da Vinci's uh, notebooks. So that was one of the earliest graphical representations of Spanish burns was from Leonardo da Vinci. What's interesting about this is we can follow this through. So this is obviously our hall line here. So obviously one comes in, one comes out. I've got two on this anchor point. One is continuing down, one comes in, one comes out, and then it terminates. So this is actually terminated with just one. I've got two over here, one over here. We won't worry about the anchor too much on this one, just figure out the MA. So one comes in, one comes out, one comes in, one comes out, and I've got a two. That two tensions is pulling on another system. So this, as you can see, is a whole other system, like a backwards uh, uh, type of J. So that two to one, uh, or two tensions goes in. So two goes in, two comes out, I've got four. So as four goes in, four comes out, I've got eight in my next system. Eight goes in, eight comes out, I got 16. 16 goes in, 16 comes out, and I've got 32. So when we look at that system, that is a bunch of different rope segments, right? but it maintains a really high efficiency. So is something applicable for what we're doing? Probably not. But in the end, it's good practice for counting your tensions. And when you get into efficiencies, it actually plays a huge role in understanding how you can maximize the efficiency of any of your systems. So that is the Spanish Burton. So basically we're looking at a 32 to one mechanical advantage in that system that is Spanish Burton in origin. Over here, We'll take a look at this one. This is this goes by a bunch of different names. Um, you'll see different names from you know uh, from obviously it's a two to one pulling on a two to one to change direction, but it can be flying J's because of the J look that it has on there. Uh, this is obviously even because the end of my rope starts at my anchor. So if we just follow that down and we go in and and figure out where where our system goes, we start from our hull line with one. One tension goes in, one tension comes out. Two is up here at the anchor. One tension comes in, one tension comes out and terminates. Now, because one tension went in, one tension came out, I have two sitting right here on the apex of this pulley, which is being pulled by the other part of our two to one. So now because this is pulling on this, it goes, two goes in, two goes out, uh, or I'm sorry, one comes in, one comes out, I've got two. So now two goes in, two goes out down here, which is giving me my four to one. So this is a four to one compound mechanical advantage. Compound because I have two simple systems, a two to one and a two to one with the change of direction, and the two to one's pulling on the other two to one. So, once again, one comes in, one comes out, one comes in, one comes out, two is sitting here. So, now that two is sitting here, two comes in, two comes out, four is down here, whatever number I'm left with at my load is my mechanical advantage. And here, I think we have another Petzl example, which is, is a good one too. So, we can look at this real quick and be like, hey, I recognize this as a three to one. The hall line of my three to one is being pulled by a two to one. So in a case like that, I can go, okay, I, I know that this is gonna be uh, a six to one mechanical advantage because two times three is six. But let's just double check this counting tensions and we'll also be able to see what we have on our anchor. And so as we look at that, this is obviously my hall line, which is enacting everything. So if one comes in, one comes out and it terminates and I have two sitting on this press it. Right now, because I have two sitting here, two is going into this. So if two goes in, two comes out, which means I have four. When two goes in, two comes out, which means I have four up here on my anchor. That two comes down, meets with what I had previously, which is four. And two plus four is six, and I've got my six to one. So that's just another way to back up what you're, what you're counting already, even if you use the cut motion where you can figure this out. Uh, I know that that's a, a six to one mechanical advantage. All right, moving on. We're going to do a whole separate podcast of different ways that you can rig your piggyback systems. In your piggyback system, super easy is you have a main line that's on a progressive capture. Uh, it's basically just a one-to-one. -one. We attach a secondary or a separate mechanical advantage that usually that's pre-rigged, like the examples over here onto our main line and we pull. So in the end, whatever the mechanical advantage is that we're attaching onto our main line is what the MA is gonna be. So our main line must have a progressive capture device in order to be able to reset this, this piggyback system. But our progressive capture on our main line does not always have to be really uber efficient. So we could just use a one-way munter if we wanted to. Any system at all because all we're doing is as we pull 
off our piggyback system, our main line gets slack in it. And because all of our weight is on our piggyback system, we can't reset that forward once it collapses all the way. So at that point, we take all that slack out of our main line uh, to be able to capture our load. Then we uh, release the capture on our uh, piggyback system, and that's what allows us to reset it because our main line is being held by its own progressive capture. So under normal conditions, until we get into some voodoo stuff, that does not have to be efficient whatsoever. So as you see here, all we did was attach a three to one onto our main line, and it is nothing more than a three to one piggyback system. When we look at some of the ones commercially available, this is the new one from North American Rescue that's hidden uh, on the website really soon, which is their individual mechanical advantage system, which is a pocket mechanical advantage system that articulates with almost everything. So on this, if we would place this on here, I'm going to just enlarge this a little bit. We can see that this is set up into a set of four, set of five um, type of example. So in this place, if this rope grab goes onto our main line, I've got one, two, three, four sections supporting that. So this is the four to one configuration. I could flip this around backwards and it would be a five to one, which we kind of showed here with the Aztec system, which is also just a small little uh, uh, personal haul system that you can attach onto any rope system. So in this configuration, we can notice we see one, two, three, four lines supporting it. This line over here is our haul line, which is being pulled downward, so only four lines supporting it. That's the four to one configuration, but we could flip it back upside down, attach this onto our rope, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, and this would be our five to one configuration where we're pulling upwards on this way. So your set of fours can be reversed and you need to get a four to one or five to one, but there's a lot more voodoo that you can do with that. In the end, whatever MA you're putting onto your main line is going to be what your mechanical advantage is. So for our purpose of this, last one I want to hit and then, then we'll round up uh, this part one is if you look at a lot of our systems, let me just go backwards here to, to show an example. Um, this will probably be good. If you look at this five to one complex system, when I'm pulling, I've got more weight on my anchor than I do hauling. So although I have five tensions down here, I have six tensions here. We already said that's because I'm pulling against my anchor. If I'm pulling with my anchor, then I have one less than what my mechanical advantage is. So if we look at a, a simple five to one, because I'm pulling towards my anchor, right? I've got five tensions down here. I have four tensions down here because you are holding the other tension in your hand. That's what makes up your, your five to one. So we're always one off, right? So if I'm pulling against my anchor, then I've got one more tension up here than I do in my mechanical advantage, what I have in my load. If I'm pulling with my anchor, I've got one less tension on my anchor than I do at my load because I'm holding that other one in my hand and I'm not magnifying the force with the change of direction. Where people sometimes get confused is when you get into some of the Spanish Burton uh, variants. So everything makes sense here, right? It's a three to one um, because I'm pulling against my anchor. I've got one more up here, so it's four. But then we look over on this craziness of the six to one on your Spanish burden. So what you have to realize on this one is if I'm looking at the six to one Spanish burden compared to the seven to one Spanish burden, right? The only difference is, is this portion that is a separate anchor, which could be on your harness. Uh, it could be on uh, another separate anchor, uh, a progressive, uh, or basically you could set that up on a cam or anything like that. If you've got some really weird, environmental pathology you're dealing with uh, trying to get somebody up a, up a mountain and you're just trying to put whatever MA in there to get them across a the crux. Um, this is a separate anchor. So when you look at it, the only real difference between the six to one and the seven to one is this piece right here. This is a separate anchor where on your seven to one, this piece is tied directly into here. So Understand that although I've got a six to one here and an eight to one here, and you're like, that makes no sense. How can that happen? It's because the force that's seen on this anchor is distributed already into this load. If you see it, like one goes in, one comes out. So this one is down here, but it's magnified and put into this number here. So in the end, it's basically the same forces just with the separate anchor that you see on the seven to one to eight to one. So it just so happens that, that this changes and this is down here and this is being pulled on by a separate, separate system, but the force that it generates is magnified into this portion. So that being said, that was a lot of 
talking. Uh, go back through any of those examples, email with us with any questions whatsoever. The next one, which will I would highly recommend, is gonna be estimating system efficiency. Counting tensions is one of those things that can help you in certain aspects when you're looking at Anchor or you're looking at, I don't even know what the hell I just built or what the hell you just built, but we can count through and see what we got. Understand that when you're looking at pulley systems, especially when you get into complex systems and Spanish burdens and stuff like that, regardless of simple, compound, complex, basically when you're looking at it with only four pulleys, there's over a hundred different um, mechanical advantages that you can create. So it's, it's an exponent. It's psychotic, the amount that you can make with just four pulleys and how you place them and what you do with them. Whether you're doing something even, you're doing something odd, you're doing complex systems like a Spanish Burton. So with only four, there's a hundred different variants. So that will help with some of the confusion that can arise when you're looking at various systems, regardless of your discipline, whether you're looking at cave rescue, traditional rescue, uh, like technical rescue, canyon rescue, mountain rescue, climbing, and just creating mechanical advantage to get somebody past the crux, not necessarily doing a rescue. Um, the big part is, is understanding your system efficiency and understanding that I can have three pulleys and all three pulleys could be a different efficiency. One could be a bushing pulley, which is like 72% efficient. One could be a sealed bearing pulley, which is like 90 to 93% efficient. And then I can have, you know, whatever I have is my progressive capture in there. And regardless, you know, whether I have a built-in internal cam or I'm having to pull that through a prusik, which is decreasing my, my efficiency, because I have to go through a, a, a device or a rope grab that's meant to cause friction. I'm decreasing that efficiency in my system. This is what will make you help you understand where each pulley will maximize and increase the efficiency of your system. So where does that lower efficient pulley need to go compared to the higher efficient pulley compared to maybe I don't have enough pulleys and I just need to go around a carabiner because that's all I have on me. Where do those go in the system? Because that same kit put into a system can go in multiple different ways and all of them leading to a different system efficiency. So it's the difference between having three or four people haul on a line and one person being able to haul on the line just by where you place your pulleys and doing it effectively. And then part three is gonna be a little bit of voodoo with piggybacks because people look at system set of fours uh, and their piggyback system is just this, this very basic system. You can actually do a whole bunch with them just by manipulating physics a little bit and exploiting efficiencies to where we can easily go from a four to one and with adding two more pieces of kit, go up to a 23 to one and still maintain enough efficiency to, to get that haul lift done, uh, especially if you're doing something that's not human in nature. Um, and vehicle recovery or something in confined space, lifting something very, very heavy for a short distance. So that's the next set. If you have any questions, hit us up at info at elementrescue.com. Thanks. Click your beaters, tip your hats. I got ice, cold ice, ice, ice water ice, blowing ice, up both my caps. Sand blowing down as I hit the crevasse. Don't bother me, man. I got another pass. And the big plan ain't 